Um, left off at le verse 4. What I'm going to do is just back up, recap, and, and as we go on. Of course, Paul's uh, telling us um, how we can experience those riches in Christ Jesus. In fact, that's his prayer to the Ephesians and to us. He says, I pray that the eyes of your heart will be enlightened so you will know the hope of his calling and the riches that you have in Christ Jesus. But one of the things that he's pointed out here, and he will continue to point out here, is you're saved right where you're at. You've got to understand that before you even begin to experience these riches. You've got to understand where you are right now. You're seated in the heavenly places, and you have all the riches of Christ Jesus at your disposal. It's up to you if you're, you know, if you're going to really experience that. So let's go ahead and back up. And of course, again, Paul's writing to the church of Ephesus. Uh, Ephesus was a port city, and there was lots of debauchery, all, all kinds of carnal activity. There was temple prostitute. There was drugs. There was alcohol. Um, there was lots of crime because you got all these nations that were coming in through this port city as they um, would disperse their cargo throughout the regions. So, uh, but he's writing to the saints that are there. As we pick up in chapter 1, verse 1, it says, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God, not by man's will, not because I'm such a great fellow, but because God has willed this. And of course, we know that Paul was a very educated man biblically, but we also know from the book of Colossians, he says that education was no value. He counted everything that he'd done, you know, in the keeping of the law and trying to be righteous. He counted it as dung, as actually the Greek word that's used there. <laughs> he counted it you know, as just waste. But God had prepared Paul, you know, from the womb for this very purpose, to proclaim the, the gospel message. He says, to the saints who are at Ephesus and who are faithful in Christ Jesus, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. How is, you know, we're always trying, religiously, uh, we're always trying to appeal to God, to appease God, to bless God through our own strength and power. And basically what Paul's saying here, God is blessed once you recognize the riches, the blessings that you have in Christ Jesus. Master, how can we do the works of God? The disciples asked Jesus. Jesus says there's only one thing, just one thing that you can do. One thing, believe in the one the Father has sent. That's how we can bless God, by believing God, believing in His promise, believing in the sacrifice, believing in the way of righteousness that He's prepared for us. Blessed be the God and Father who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenlies, in, in, in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, just as He chose us in Him. From the Mount of Transfiguration, you could hear that great proclamation. This is my beloved son, my chosen one. You know, God is not picking and choosing. He's, in fact, that's what we're going to learn here. That it is his, his will for all mankind to be saved. That, that was the kind intention of his will, he tells us. He says, this is my beloved son, my chosen one. Jesus says, when I am high and lifted up, I'm going to draw all men to myself. Jesus draws all men to himself, but not all men choose Jesus. Those who says, I receive what Jesus has done, they're now placed in him. We're in Christ. God doesn't pick and choose Barney or me or Glenn and leave everyone else out that's in the sanctuary. No, he says he's chose, we're chosen in him. We choose Jesus. We're in him. We're going to get dig deeper into this in just a moment. He says, oh, from the foundation of the world that we would be holy and blameless, complete, without Sin, holy and blameless before him. He wants to make us holy and blameless. 
so we can stand before him. And this, this was from the very foundation of the world. Jesus Christ was crucified before the foundation of the world. We like to look back 2,000 years and say this is the point in which sin was forgiven. We'd like to do that. Say, you know, it was 2,000 years, but the Bible tells us Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified before the... F I just mixed two verses there. But he was crucified before the foundation of the world that would be holy and blameless in him. God made a path for our righteousness through the forgiveness of sin before the foundation of the world. He says... He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world that we would be holy and blameless before Him. <sighs> there was a point I was trying to make here and I missed it. <laughs> All right, we will press on. What's that? Yes, it was in the garden, but that's not the point I was trying to establish here. He says, be holy and blameless before the foundation of the world. In love. Oh. It just clicked. <laughs> we were all in Adam, right? Well, again, this is something we're going to get deeper into. You know, we, you know we, we read in the book of Revelation as those whose names were not found in the book of life. You know, the other books would be open. But what most people don't understand is God's will was for all mankind to be saved. Or, yeah, all men to be saved. All of our names were written in the book of life. Every single person is names written in the book of life. This was God's will for all mankind. Because Peter tells us that it's not God's will for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. His will was salvation for all mankind. Now, listen, he says, in love, he predestined us, predestined, and a lot of, there's a lot of Bible teachers that go to an extreme with this idea of predestined. We were all uh, predestined to death because we all came from Adam. Although our names are written in the book of life, uh, we were all predestined for Adam because when Adam sinned, he was placed outside of the Garden of Eden. We were all in Adam at the moment when sin entered the world. And when Adam was placed outside of the Garden of Eden, we were all placed out with him because we're born now, separated God from God in a fallen world, right? I mean, we all agree with that, right? So rather you sinned or not, of course, none of us had sinned at that point. Adam sinned. But we're born separated from God, separated from His Spirit, from the Spirit of life. We were all separated with Him. Our names, every single person who would come from Adam, their names are written in the book of life. But when Adam was separated from God, we were all separated from Him. So we're all born in death, predestined for hell. Every single one of us. Because we're on that Adam train, as we've illustrated in the past. We were in the Adam train, but God has provided a way for us to be saved, all mankind. You got a train, you got a train that's come from that, that's coming from St. Louis that's predestined for Dallas, Texas. It's passing through Kennett. Then you got a train that's predestined from Saint, uh, to St. Louis from Dallas. You see that? And so you get to Kennett and says, you know what? I don't want to go to Dallas. But you see, you're on a train that's predestined for Dallas. The only way that you can get back to St. Louis is to switch trains. A train that is predestined for St. Louis. You see, we were all on the Adam train, predestined for hell. But God has given us a way. To switch trains, so to speak. Paul describes him in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 52, that he's the last, or 50, somewhere in that neighborhood, that he's the last Adam. Jesus Christ is the last Adam. So we're predestined for hell, but it is God's will for all mankind to be saved. So he's provided a way to heaven. And he provided this way, as Paul tells us, from the very foundation of the world. He knew that man would become separated. But his will is for all mankind to be saved. 
That is the last Adam train, the one that predestines us to heaven. So if we were predestined for hell when we're born, but God has provided a way for us to be predestined to heaven in Him, in Christ. You see, we have to make that choice. I don't like where I'm headed. I've got to, I've got to, I want to head in a different direction. That's repentance. I don't like this direction. This direction is going to lead to death. But God has provided a way for me to change my destination. Therefore, he's predestined us in Christ Jesus. In Christ, we have salvation. And, and he did this for, his, for God so loved the world. In love, he predestined us. He loved all mankind. Jesus said, when I'm high and lifted up, I will draw all men to myself. But not all, all men choose Jesus, God's grace and forgiveness. He predestined us to adoption as sons through Jesus Christ to himself according to the kind intention of his will. Judgment is coming. But God has provided a way for us to escape that judgment. That's his kind intention. He, he predestined us because he is kind. He's, he loves us. He cares for us. But he's not going to force himself upon anyone. He's a perfect gentleman. To the praise of the glory of his grace, which he freely bestowed upon us in the beloved. His grace. That's about his grace. He showed us grace through Jesus Christ. He provided a way for us to be saved through Jesus Christ. He, he says, I will make a path. He tells Adam in the Garden of Eden, I will make a path. I will deal with your sin issue. And then, and then, then his, this promise is manifested in Jesus Christ. In him, we have, the, we have redemption. We can be redeemed. We can be bought back. We're sold into slavery. But we're redeemed in Christ Jesus. Through his blood, the forgiveness of our transgressions according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished on us. <laughs> that lavish it just means like overwhelming, an endless supply. It poured out grace. He lavished upon us. In all wisdom and insight, he made known to us the mystery of his will. It's a great mystery. Mystery is something that was once concealed but unveiled. This, this mystery of his will. What is God's will? But the promise was made in the Garden of Eden that God would provide a way for man to be saved. And for millenniums, there was this promise of, of a Messiah who would, who would deal with the sin issue. But in the Garden, we see the two hearts. We see the, the heart of Cain. We also see the heart of Abel. Abel. God says, I, I'm going to provide a way for mankind to be saved. There's going to be blood spilt. Blood poured out. And Abel believed God. He, and in the, the proof in the pudding of his belief was the fact that God says, I'm going to offer a sacrifice. I'm going to offer a lamb who will take away the sin of the world. Abel believed that. God, and, and Abel's heart was like, God, you have blessed me. I want to bless you. So the lamb that he offered there at the garden entr entrance of the garden was, it was symbolic of what his belief. It was a representation of what, that he believed God. Cain, on the other hand, didn't believe God. God, because you see the sin debt is owed by man, therefore the sin debt has to be paid by man. And then Abel, Cain says, I, I'll pay my own sin debt, you see. And so he brings a sacrifice that represents his heart. He wasn't believing God. He says, I can deal with my sin issue. I can appeal to God. I can appease God. So he brings a sacrifice that was based upon unbelief of what God had promised. He goes on to say, 
He says, who made known to us the mystery of his will. God's will was for mankind to be saved. But through these millenniums, just like Cain, man kept bringing God a religion. They didn't believe God, so they bring God a religion. For millenniums, man brought God a religion. And then finally, God is like, okay, you think you can be saved through a religious system? Then this is what it's going to take. He gives, he taps Moses on the shoulder and says, Moses, this is the perfect religious system. If mankind really believes that he can be saved through a religious system, here's the perfect religious system. You've got to follow these rules. You've got to make these sacrifices. You've got to keep these rules, rites, and rituals. You've got to do this. You've got to do this. You've got to keep this perfect diet. And then not only that, if you're going to be righteous, then you're going to have to separate yourself from the rest of the world. But there's a better way. Written in this law, this law that describes what righteousness looks like, the sacrifices required this, uh, uh, this, th this required for breaking this law. But there's a temple system that's, that, that was written in this law, a tabernacle that was a picture of Jesus Christ. Everything that was happening in that temple was describing what man, or I'm sorry, what God was going to do for mankind. That had, how God would come and deal with the sin issue. But Israel could not see this. It was all concealed, you see, in the law. God's righteousness and how God would deal with man's sin. It was all concealed in the law. But God has made known the mystery of his will. The sin debt's owed by man. The sin debt, therefore, has to be paid by man. The religious Jews were looking at that law saying, this is how we can deal with our sin. But what did Jesus say? Jesus says, you search the scriptures because you think in them you have eternal life. But it is these that give testimony of me. You see, this was concealed from them. The mystery of God's will was concealed from them. So what, what is, how has it been revealed? Paul tells us in uh, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, great is the mystery of godliness, that God became a man. The sin debt was owed by man. Man could not pay this sin debt in his own strength and power. So what does God do? God becomes a man. That was the mystery of his will. The, it was revealed, his will was revealed through Jesus Christ. The kind intention of his will for man to be saved. That God would deal with the sin. God would pay the sin penalty. According to the kind intention which he purposed in him. God's angry. God's, you know, condemning. Well, there is a judgment that is coming. But his intention, his will is to save all mankind. With a view of an administration suitable for the fullness of the times, that is the summing up of all things in Christ. Everything that was written in the Old Testament was summed up in Jesus Christ. It was all about Him. Every chapter, every verse was all about Him. But the end of all things is also summed up, wrapped in Jesus Christ. He, he's inheriting all things. He's, he's going to receive all things, but we receive all things in him. He goes on to say, in the heavens and the things on the earth, in him, in him, we have obtained an inheritance. What is our inheritance? Jesus Christ. We inherit him in all things that are found in him, that are summed up in him. Adam was in the garden, right? He was given dominion over all things. The animals, the plants, the, the, the whole earth. You know, if you ever wonder what Adam had, the power and authority that Adam had, all you have to do is look at Jesus Christ, the one who was able to walk on water, the one who was able to calm the storm with his voice, with a single word, the one who was at peace with all the beasts of the field. The one who was able to cleanse the leper, raise the dead. That was Adam's power and authority. All that's being restored in Christ. 
We're, we're, we're going to receive all this inheritance. <clears throat> Who works all things after the counsel of his will. <clears throat> Excuse me. To the end that we who were the first to hope in Christ would be to the praise of his glory. Jesus gets all the glory, but we're the praise of the glory of Jesus, you see. In him, you also. This is the nuts and bolts of it all right here, this, this next verse. In him, you also, after listening to the message of the truth, where's this message of truth found? Jesus says you search the Scriptures because you think in them you have eternal life, but it is these that's given testimony of me. But what does the law show us? Mankind believed that he could reach God through some sort of religious system. This law that God gave to us shows us how that's impossible, that we're separated God, we're incapable of being righteous in our own strength and power that we're eternally separated from God because we do not have that ability to be righteous? That's the message of truth. The message of truth that I'm a dirty, rotten sinner. I have wicked thoughts. I'm selfish. I'm rebellious. That's the message of truth. You see that? That's what the law was describing. Paul said, I would not have known because Paul believed he kept that law perfectly. But then he realized, man, I covet. The law showed him that. That's what the law is designed to show us, that uh, that we're sinful, that we can't keep a law, that we're separated from God, that we need a physician. But this law also shows us, points us to the physician, the great healer, the message of truth, that we're separated from God. But God has made a way for mankind. The law showed us our sin, the sacrifices that we require, but it was also that same law was pointing us to the solution to our problem, our, our situation, our, our condition. In him, you also, after listening to the message of truth, the gospel of our salvation, the good news of our, our salvation, having also believed Having also believed, there's the real question. Do you truly believe that God loves you, that God has forgiven you? Because if you don't believe that, then you're always going to be struggling and straining and striving and and trying to impress God, appeal to God, appease God. I'm a good boy. I'm a good girl. Look at what I'm doing here. But see, Jesus says there's only one thing you can do. Believe in the one the Father has sent. I'm totally incapable of righteousness. God has sent me a pathway to righteousness that's found in Jesus Christ. And if I will put my faith in the sacrifice that he's made in my stead, how he's paid my sin penalty, if I put my faith in him, I have eternal life. But do you believe that? Do you believe you have eternal life? Are you at peace today? Have you found your satisfaction and fulfillment? Are you still trying to obtain, trying to find satisfaction in this world through a career, through drugs or through alcohol, through sex, whatever the case may be? Do you believe that you're just passing through, that this world is one day going to be destroyed, the world that God spoke into existence, and he has a perfect plan for you and everything that happens to you? Rather it be tragic or rather it be glorious. It's for your own good. Do you believe that? Do you believe that cancer was good? The sickness was good? The death of a loved one? Do you believe that was good? That it was for you? That God put you in a situation to change you? You see, we're all white-knuckling this world. And sometimes our situations and circumstances can become severe because God is trying to loosen our grip on this world. He'll take a loved one from us. Why? Because he wants our hope in heaven, you see. My loved one's in heaven. My heart has followed my loved one. For wherever my treasure is, there my heart is also. 
Do you believe? I pray that the eyes of your heart will be enlightened, Paul will go on to say. That you will know the hope of his calling. The hope, eternal life. And we're all going to be taken out of this world. We're all going to be snatched away, hopefully next week. We're all going to be snatched away. We're going to be with Jesus for all eternity, our true treasure, our inheritance. Do you believe? Because believing is what changes your perception. Faith changes things. It changes how I view things. We've often heard prayer changes things. No, it's faith that changes things. Prayer changes you when you have an honest prayer life with the Lord. But see, when you put your faith in Jesus, it changes your perception of all things. Your perception of this world changes your hope. Having also believed, you were sealed. Do you believe that? In Him. Sealed in. You're sealed in Him. The Greeks, when they sent cargo across the GNC, and a lot of this cargo was coming into Ephesus, there was a seal upon the cargo. That seal spoke of ownership. You see, what they would do is they, they would put wax upon the, seal, or the closure of the, the cargo, and they'd put their insignia ring on that. That seal, that spoke of ownership. This belongs to this guy's insignia. The, who owns this insignia? It belongs to him. We're sealed in Christ. We belong to God. We have been adopted into his family through his son, Jesus Christ. And we're sealed. We belong to God. Do you believe you belong to God now? Do you believe that God is your father? Better yet, he's your friend. Do you believe that? If you believe he's your father, if you believe he, he's your friend, then what do you have to fear? If you believe that he's causing all things to work together for good, for those who uh, believe in him, who, those who are in Christ Jesus, you see, it should change your perception of how you view all things. Ah, miss, okay. In him, you also, after listening to the message of Shrew, the gospel of your salvation, having also believed, you were sealed in him with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is given as a pledge. The Holy Spirit is a pledge that I belong to God. He's given me his spirit. I'm sealed in Christ Jesus, but I'm also being given this pledge. You know, when you, when you go to buy a house and you're serious about purchasing that, purchasing that house, the owner says, well, I need some earnest money. I need you to put some earnest money down, saying that you're serious about this. You see, that's, that's the earnest money that we have, the, the Holy Spirit. But he's also our comforter. He, he, he's, he's our guide. He's our... He's our Peace, you see. He's. It also speaks of. Oh yeah, yeah. This pledge, this insignia, it, it spoke of a. It spoke of a, an engagement. You know, when, when when there's a when there's an engagement, there's a promise that's attached. But see, in Jewish weddings, there was the there was the the marriage. I'm sorry, the. Oh, I'm losing my train of thought this morning. The, um, when, when Moses and, and Mary, when they first come together, they were legally married, but they were separated for a period of time. Um, the, the, there was the, the, the reading of the contract. The marriage was, was made. The, Mary at this time belongs to, Mo, or to Joseph, but she, they were not together. It was that, that pledge, that, that, that insignia that spoke of the ownership, but also the promise that the bridegroom would one day come and get back and get his bride. Um, 
Engagement. Yes, that was legal marriage. That was engagement. I don't know why I couldn't think of that word. But they were legally married, married in this engagement. We have an engagement with the Lord Jesus Christ. We legally <coughs> belong to him because he's purchased us, you see, with his blood, with his sacrifice. And we're sealed in him. His insignia is upon us. Why could I not think of that word engagement? And no one was helping me out here except for Charlie. <laughs> uh, with the view of the redemption of God's own possession to the praise of his glory. Um, let's go ahead and stop there. I know it's early yet. But I want to take the final portion of this chapter in one lump sum. So, Paul's point at this point is that we belong to Jesus Christ. We're saved right where we are. We're going to heaven. We have the seal of His Holy Spirit. We've been sealed in Him. Nothing's going to change us. Nothing, nothing. And Jesus says, you're in the palm of my hand. No one can snatch you away. So, Paul is saying, you're saved right where you are. And the implication of uh, the, some of the things that he goes on to say, talking about don't steal, don't commit adultery, don't, you know, do, don't be a drunkard. The implication is that these people were involved in such activities. But Paul says, you're saved right where you are. See, he wants to take them deeper. He wants them to understand the relationship they have with Jesus Christ. They, he wants to understand the riches that they have in Christ Jesus. So he doesn't, he doesn't start this letter off with condemnation. He starts this, word, this letter off with a, with a great encouragement. You're saved. You're going to heaven. But man, there's so much more for you to see and experience. There's so much more that you, you, you just... He, that's why he says, I pray that the eyes of your heart will be enlightened so you'll know these riches, know these riches intimately. And then in chapter 2, he'll go on to say, put this off. Put off the flesh. Don't view these things of the world through fleshly eyes. View them through your spiritual eyes. But we'll get deeper into that as we pick up in chapter 2. But there's so much more he's got to say here in chapter 1. And like I said, we'll, we'll pick up next week and uh, we'll finish up the chapter. Let's go ahead and close with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for loving us. We thank you for redeeming us. We thank you for your Holy Spirit who you've given us a pledge. We thank you for sealing us in Christ Jesus. Uh, Lord, we know we're saved because of what he's done and not based upon anything we do. That's your will for us to have eternal life and to experience the riches of Christ Jesus. And we thank you for this letter of, to the Ephesians so we can come to grips and understand uh, that you have a great love toward us, and you've poured yourself out in love so that we can be with you and experience the fullness of, uh, of a relationship with you. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.